Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. Let's just get right into it today. What you see on your screen before you is a document entitled Investigation of Competition in Digital Markets. This is a document that was put out yesterday by the Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial, and Administrative Law, a subcommittee of the Committee on the Judiciary of the U.S. House of Representatives, and is a very important document. Now, you might have seen some headlines around the internet talking about what they found with respect to Google and Amazon and Facebook, and from our perspective, most importantly, Apple. And what they found was that all of these companies in various different ways they feel are abusing their monopoly power, are in violation of the antitrust laws, or if they aren't in violation of the current antitrust laws, they should be. And those laws need to be changed. Current judiciary decisions, their opinions, the precedent need to be modified, need to be overruled by passage of a new law. And that's going to present problems for basically all of these companies, probably in the near term. But the secondary question that people ask me as part of this series, Epic versus Everyone, the Fortnite antitrust lawsuits, is what does this actually mean from a legal perspective right this second? And the answer to that is relatively simple. And if you take nothing else away from this video, take this. This doesn't do anything on its own. As I tweeted out last night, this is a political document. And I also noted it was Democrat-led. We will see as part of this video why that probably doesn't matter so much in respect to the findings that were made here. And it should be taken as such, taken as a political document, not a legal one. But it is certainly interesting to see a major House committee declare effectively all current big tech companies as monopoly abusers in violation of antitrust laws or what they feel the laws should be. Said another way, if you go back to your elementary school education, if you're a U.S. citizen, or if you just know anything about this, if you're not, the United States government is created of three co-equal branches, right? You've got the legislature, you've got Congress in one branch, you've got the president, the executive in another branch, and then you've got the judiciary, you've got the judges and the courts in that third branch. So Congress is saying effectively to itself that we need to change these laws, we need to encourage various people to do various things in the executive branch or the judicial branch, but at the end of the day, it can't force those branches to do these things. It can't mandate the Department of Justice do something. It can't mandate that the Federal Trade Commission do something. And it can't mandate that a judge like the one that we we're talking about in Epic versus Apple make a certain determination to find these facts as Congress did. But with that as your background, this is certainly evidence and particularly strong evidence based on the level of investigation that was undertaken here, that Epic will undoubtedly file as part of its court case against Apple and say to the judge, look, Congress spent all this money, spent all this time looking at Apple, made these findings of fact. Judge, you should make the same findings of fact. Now, there will be certain kind of tensions and frictions, as we will see when we get to the recommendations, where even this subcommittee says, well, maybe the antitrust law doesn't actually prevent X, Y, or Z. That could be a problem. Certainly, the judicial precedents that we have talked about, about market definition and determination and single brands and breach of contract, won't change just because Congress put up a document but it will fundamentally change the weight of the evidence on Epic side and could change how the judge ultimately thinks about certainly things like the preliminary injunction where Epic has to show a likelihood of winning and that likelihood probably has gone up with the presence of this evidence and whether or not that changes how the judge would determine something on a preliminary injunction level is up in the air. But what's most important is that this doesn't end the issue these findings don't establish the findings for the court or any other court that is evaluating issues like these, but they are very important, which is why we're going to talk about them. Now, the very first thing I've highlighted here is a bit of a problem, a bit of a weakness in the document, and that is that the online platforms investigated by the subcommittee are Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, which are four giant companies in software and hardware, in big tech, but that operate in different markets that do different things to increase their market share, preserve their market presence, whatever it might be. And the end result of that is that Apple is treated similarly to Facebook when it comes to recommendations, is treated similar to Google and to Amazon in a way that I don't necessarily think makes sense and which winds up having this subcommittee, this document skip some of the important aspects of what Apple is doing differently 
from Amazon and Facebook and Google. Most specifically, the kind of notion of the walled garden that we've talked about in this series extensively. The whole notion that Apple is controlling its own hardware, that they created a product that they use their iOS on, and that is distinct from, say, Microsoft selling Windows and mandating certain things on hardware that they didn't create, that they don't control, that distinction is lost in this document, isn't really even established. And so I think you could have done this better with maybe four separate documents. I'm not Congress. I'm not in charge of these various things. But it's worth noting that a lot of the language here is focused on, in particular, I would say, Facebook and Google, social networking and search and marketing and ad sales, a little bit more than Amazon's retail presence and Apple's app store presence, though both receive damning fact patterns and fact findings from this Congress, which is why we're going to talk about them. Several markets investigated by the subcommittee, such as social networking, general online search, and online advertising, are dominated by just one or two firms. We've seen that with respect to the claims made about Apple and Android, that they are a duopoly of mobile operating system providing. Now, we're going to look at the executive summary of all four companies here because I think it's useful. I think it'll be useful to you. We are only going to dive in with particularity in respect of Apple. We're not going to go deep into Google because Epic and Google haven't really progressed their court case very far outside of a little bit of preliminary filings in that case. We haven't looked at it that much. And ultimately, the Apple discussion about whether or not you can have an app store, you can charge 30% and those kinds of things are going to be applicable to Google in any event with respect to that specific case. But let's look at what they say about Facebook. They say Facebook has a monopoly power in the market for social networking. They say this for a number of reasons, including that Facebook buys up places like Instagram, etc. But one of the things that Congress has to establish is how this hurts consumers right now under the current laws. They say in the absence of competition, Facebook's quality has deteriorated over time resulting in worse privacy protections for its users and a dramatic rise in misinformation on its platform. Now, that's interesting in and of itself, especially the misinformation standpoint, because it's not clear to me that social networking or that people that use social networking on a regular basis expect accuracy as part of the product delivery from Facebook. The connectivity is really what Facebook is delivering for the most part, would be my argument if I were Facebook counsel or if I were looking at this from a different perspective. But it's undoubtedly true that Facebook can do what it wants with your data and you can decide to leave it. And the social networking function in and of itself creates certain barriers to others entering that market because the entirety of the product is that so many people are here. So Facebook is an interesting question. We're not going to dive into it too deeply. Maybe we will return to this document to talk about each of these companies at some point. But their claim here is that Facebook's quality is deteriorating because they effectively have these high barriers to entry and they buy up everybody that could threaten them. Similarly, they say in respect of Google that Google has a monopoly in the markets for general online search and search advertising, that they have a tendency to use their search monopoly to misappropriate content from third parties, and then most importantly to us, that after purchasing the Android operating system in 2005, Google used contractual restrictions and exclusivity provisions to extend Google's search monopoly from desktop to mobile. Documents show that Google required smartphone manufacturers to pre-install and give default status to Google's own apps like Google Play, impeding competitors in search as well as in other app markets. This is the reason why earlier in the series I said Epic's claim against Google and Android might actually be stronger because these specific facts really mirror the problems that Microsoft had in terms of putting Windows on other people's hardware and mandating certain things about Internet Explorer in a way that I don't think is the same with Apple controlling its own hardware access, but which we will see down below is not necessarily what Congress thinks about Apple's hardware access. In respect of Amazon, you see the first instance of a little bit of language that we will see throughout this document. Amazon has significant and durable market power in the U.S. online retail market. Now, you see significant and durable market power because Congress wants to be able to say that they aren't otherwise a monopolist, sure, but they can do very bad things and not lose their market share. So Congress and Sherman and Clayton and everything else should be concerned with them anyway, regardless of the fact that they aren't a monopolist. As the blue sentence here says, although Amazon is frequently described as controlling about 40% of U.S. online retail sales, this market share is likely understated in estimates of about 50% or higher 
are more credible. And they don't cite things here in the executive summary. They cite them in the 100 pages where they talk about these various companies, but we're not going to go and look at that level of detail at Amazon in particular. But suffice it to say, you can't claim that Amazon is a monopolist of online retail sales, so you have to basically say that they're really strong. The platform has monopoly power over many small and medium-sized businesses that do not have a viable alternative to Amazon for reaching online consumers. Now, I'm just taking a step back here. I'm not in Congress. I respect these findings. I know they worked hard for this in the investigation. I don't know that sentences like this make a ton of sense to me. They don't have a viable alternative to reaching online consumers on the whole. You can't set up a website. You can't put up a a Shopify account, whatever it might be. You can't have Teespring sell t-shirts on your video just below the description. Please do check those out. A lot of good t-shirts there here from Virtual Legality. It seems to me like what they're trying to say is what they will actually say with respect to Apple, which is that these small and medium-sized businesses don't have a viable alternative to reaching Amazon customers and that Amazon has succeeded in winning over these customers in such a strong way, including through things like brand loyalty, we will see referenced, that these other parties can't just get people to come to their websites. But it's a bit disingenuous on its face because they absolutely do have the ability to sell things straight through the internet, which is one of the things that they bring up against Apple. Finally, they note that Amazon Web Services provides critical infrastructure for many businesses with which Amazon competes, which is not necessarily something that we should hate if we're in the United States or if we're looking at the economies here. We want competitors to be offering this access. And again, it's one of those things that when we get to the end of this document, we will see they want competitors to be offering more access. They want to revive the essential facilities doctrine. They say revive. It was never really a part of judicial interpretations of these laws to begin with, but they want those to be a part of this and that these companies should all have to offer access to their various services and platforms. What you get here, and this isn't to deride this, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in this document, and I think they did a lot of work to get to these findings, but what you have is a a kind of normal government document, which is written by a lot of people over a long period of time about a lot of different things, and it tends to meander and it tends to go all over the place, and one section doesn't necessarily line up with the next. So Amazon and Apple in particular, the reason I highlighted them this way, they don't really gel together for what they would propose to be their recommendations because they have Apple kind of locking people out. They have Amazon doing too much. They have various different definitions of the marketplace, and they're kind of trying to get around certain market definition issues, which, hey, at the end of the day, when we get to the end of this document, we'll see they want to kick out entirely. They don't think market definition should be important anymore. You should just be able to establish that you think they did something bad and that should be enough. Now, with respect to Apple, we're going to focus on this with particularity. We can see the following. Apple has significant and durable market power in the mobile operating system market. Apple's dominance in this market, where it controls the iOS mobile operating system that runs on Apple mobile devices, has enabled it to control all software distribution to iOS devices. As a result, Apple exerts monopoly power in the mobile app store market. Now, let's stop right there because this is a mistake. And I'm only calling this out because this is wrongly stated and it's wrongly stated and they won't repeat this when we actually go look at the Apple section. Apple doesn't have monopoly power in the mobile app store market. They won't even claim that later on. Apple has monopoly power if it is significant for purposes of Sherman, which is under some doubt, but Congress certainly thinks it is in this document in the distribution of software and apps on the iOS ecosystem. And so This is intended to say they have durable market power in the mobile app store market and monopoly power in their own iOS software distribution, which we will see down below. But it's important to note these things because sometimes when these things are reported, you'll only get the quote from places like The Verge or Polygon or Tech or CNN or wherever it might be based on this executive summary. These are good sentences. They're designed for that purpose. And this is a mistake here and you should note it because they don't make it again. This is just an error in how this was drafted. Now, one thing to note here in the next paragraph is something we don't really see in respect of the other companies. A nice sentence. Apple's mobile ecosystem has produced significant benefits to app developers and consumers. Launched in 2008, the App Store revolutionized software distribution on mobile devices, reducing barriers to entry for app developers and increasing the choices available to consumers. Indeed, that is Apple's primary argument. This thing is growing because developers see it as a nice place to sell their stuff and consumers see it as a nice place to get their stuff. But Congress has a problem. Despite this, 
Apple leverages its control of iOS and the App Store to create and enforce barriers to competition and discriminate against and exclude rivals while preferencing its own offerings. Now, that sentence is actually one that I have said that Apple is probably the most in trouble with respect to when talking about the rest of Epic's claims and just how Apple operates in general. Apple hasn't done a great job with its guidelines and making sure they are clear and fair and obvious. And when we see in this document that there are complaints from developers that they are ambiguous and opaque and that Apple's own offerings don't have to go through the same process, that's all true. And that gives Congress or whatever government regulatory body you want to talk about the ability to look at you and say, you're a bad actor. And now we need to look at the rest of what you do, which is why when we get to the next sentence, it becomes important because this is Epic's primary claim. Apple also uses its power to exploit app developers through misappropriation of competitively sensitive information and to charge app developers supra competitive prices within the app store. This is despite Apple and everybody else acknowledging that 30% is the number, that 30% is the number across various different markets. Congress has found that Apple is making supra competitive profits through the app store. And that finding is what you would ordinarily base some kind of anti-competition judgment on. Now, does the judge agree with that? I don't know, but that is Congress's finding. They also say that in the absence of competition, Apple's monopoly power over software distribution to iOS devices, note the correction here from above, has resulted in harms to competitors and competition, reducing quality and innovation among app developers and increasing prices and reducing choices for consumers. That's a heck of a finding to make, given the rapid and vast growth of the iOS ecosystem in such a short period of time. That the way Apple operates, which remember, hasn't changed since they announced the App Store, has gone forward with the App Store outside of differences in the way they treat the guidelines and various language changes that have happened with respect there too, that the 30% has remained the same, that the in-app purchases has remained the same, that the major components of the people's problems with Apple have remained the same, that Congress has found that Apple's power over its software distribution has resulted in harms to competitors and competition, reducing quality and innovation among app developers and increasing prices slash reducing choices for consumers. Consumers have been made worse off. They don't know what is best for them, despite the fact that Apple is controlling access to its own hardware. Now, here's one of those sections that I wanted to call out, not because we're going to dive deeply into it, but because we can see how this thing is framed as a document. The subcommittee examined the effects of market power in digital markets on free and diverse press, innovation, privacy and data, and other relevant matters. The subcommittee received testimony and submissions showing that the dominance of some online platforms has contributed to the decline of trustworthy sources of news, which is essential to our democracy. Google and Facebook have called out for this. The rise of market power online has also materially weakened innovation and entrepreneurship in the U.S. economy. It's a heck of a sentence, too. This has not been, the past decade, what I would consider to be a particularly weak amount of innovation and entrepreneurship. But they want to claim that basically because Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple buy up these various companies, that that creates a problem for venture capitalists and other innovators and inventors to come into the market in the first place. Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit more extensively when we get to this section uh, as it relates to Apple. But ultimately, one thing I would say is that you've got this same kind of push and pull with this document, where on the one hand, they want to say this kills investment and innovation. And on the other, they want to say these companies buy up whatever it is, 50, 50 companies a quarter across the four of them. And In my experience, when you've got those kinds of companies that are buying up so many other companies, you have a lot of people that want to enter into that target acquisition sweepstakes, right? I have plenty of clients in my career that have basically had as their business model, do the R&D, get something close to commercialization, and then get bought up by a big strategic partner that otherwise wants to outsource that research and development to you, pay you a lot for the effort, and then go away. And so that's generally been allowed. We, we like that. We like to have people and entrepreneurs that are invested in going and trying to get that exit money. And this has been found to be problematic. Worse, the Congress has found that it has killed the desire to enter into the market at all, which I, I don't know that I buy from my personal experience, which is, of course, anecdotal. But certainly it is an interesting finding by Congress here. 
In the absence of genuine competitive threats, dominant firms offer fewer privacy protections than they otherwise would, and the quality of these services has deteriorated over time. And again, they have to make this claim because in order to establish that consumers are hurt, they have to say, your service has gone down, has gotten worse. And and I think reasonable minds can differ on that score. The pattern of abusive behavior from dominant platforms raises questions about whether these firms view themselves as above the law or whether they simply treat lawbreaking as a cost of business. Lastly, the growth in the platform's market has coincided with an increase in their influence over the policymaking process. They're claiming that these big tech companies have taken over through a combination of direct lobbying and funding think tanks and academics. The dominant platforms have expanded their sphere of influence, further shaping how they are governed and regulated, which, of course, is the way that every industry works. I mean, I hate to be a cynic here or give real politic to you, but regulatory capture is a thing. When Mark Zuckerberg sits in front of Congress and says, okay, I'd be willing to be regulated if I get a seat at that table. Yep, that's that's normal. Not something that we should necessarily encourage, but should be something that evokes caution when we talk about major changes to the law if these companies are going to get a seat at the table, and they will. There's no chance that they won't. So it's something to keep in mind when we talk about these various recommendations and changes and things. Now, they've got some highlights here. We're going to talk about them in more detail, so we probably won't go over them right now to any great respect. But they say they've identified a broad set of reforms to for further examination by the members of this subcommittee for purposes of crafting legislative responses. So let's break that down, right? This report is important. It's a report of an important committee. It's a report made to all of Congress. And it recommends for them changes that the Congress should be seeking under the law. It is not, however, the law itself. It isn't legislative action itself. So we're still one step removed from that Article I legislature telling the Article II executive to do anything or changing how the Article III judiciary should view how the law is interpreted. So we're a couple of steps removed from that, but this is a recommendation for Congress to do certain things. They say they want to see structural separations. We'll talk about those, but they mean breakups and prohibitions on operating certain lines of business at the same time. Non-discrimination requirements prohibiting dominant platforms from engaging in self-preferencing. Interoperability. Presumptive prohibitions against mergers and acquisitions in the industry. Safe harbor for news publishers. Strengthening of the Clayton Act. Strengthening of the Sherman Act. Reviving antitrust enforcement against judicially created standards constraining what constitutes an antitrust injury and unduly high pleading standards. They've looked at this and said, you know what? For decades now, the judges have been getting into the way of that law that we passed, which we've talked about in this series is way too broad for any court to just interpret on its face. And we've got a problem with that. That's the overview of the recommendations. We'll talk about those in a greater respect. But for now, I want to talk about the actual findings with respect to Apple. Now, here we've got the Apple section. This goes for about 50 pages. We're going to be doing our best to summarize this, to not read every word. But there's a lot of important stuff in here. They give a little bit of background on how Apple operates. And then we get a few numbers. Apple is the leading smartphone vendor in the U.S., accounting for approximately 45% of the domestic market. So not even a majority. Globally, Apple accounts for less than 20% of the smartphone market. And roughly 25% of smartphones and tablets run on iOS worldwide. Those are not traditionally the numbers that you would anticipate for establishing monopoly power. So like Epic, in their case, what Congress winds up doing is establishing that monopoly through the access to the iOS ecosystem itself. They also have a paragraph here saying that, hey, Apple's been investigated by a lot of folks, very similar to Epic and very similar to that coalition of app fairness. In addition to the subcommittee's investigation of Apple's market power and conduct, federal antitrust authorities are investigating it for potential violations of the U.S. antitrust law. In June 2019, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal reported that the Justice Department had opened investigations into potential violations of the antitrust laws by Apple. They also footnote Apple versus Epic, as well as private antitrust lawsuits in the U.S. Now, that's really neither here nor there in respect of the current operation of the law or what Apple's currently doing, but it is useful to trying to establish that Apple is a bad actor, which is one of the things that you will see throughout this document. Maybe you agree with, maybe you don't, but they do try to establish it and they try to establish it in many, many, many pages. First, they say Apple has significant and durable market power in the market for mobile operating systems and mobile app stores, both of which are highly concentrated. It's basically 
Apple's iOS and Android globally. That's what they say. That's what every finding has said from really both sides of Apple versus Epic. So there's no reason to disbelieve it. We do note that they don't call Apple a monopolist because they aren't. But then we continue. Apple's market power is durable due to high switching costs, ecosystem lock-in, and brand loyalty. Now, brand loyalty is an interesting one. That's not traditionally one that you would see as establishing a barrier to entry, a fight between various powers, because brand loyalty is generally thought of as something that you earn. It's goodwill. It's something that a company gets from doing things that its customers like and that maybe its competitors don't like. So actually putting it here as a reason why Apple's market power is durable, to me, reads as essentially arguing against the point that you're trying to make. They further say it is unlikely that there will be a successful market entry to contest the dominance of iOS and Android, which I will tell you philosophically is something that I just flatly don't believe. I think the history of technology has seen markets disrupted by all sorts of people from all sorts of places, not the least of which was Google and Android and Apple a couple of decades ago to begin with. And so it would surprise me if you didn't have somebody else with a pocket of change going in and looking to disrupt various aspects of mobile, since there is all that money there. But Congress has found that it is unlikely, and so we press on. As a result, Apple's control over iOS provides it with gatekeeper power over, over what? Software distribution on iOS devices. Now that's almost tautological. You've heard me talk about that in this space a lot, but I find this to be the most problematic aspect of Epic's discussion of this, of now Congress's discussion of this. There is no question that Apple has gatekeeper power over software distribution on its devices. And we can talk about whether or not that is okay, but it is absolutely a monopoly provider of access to iOS. And that is very, very, very similar to how the video game consoles operate and to how a lot of different pieces of hardware in the digital economy operate, that you have control over access, that you charge a licensing fee for something operating on your operating system, that Sony gets its cut, that Microsoft or Nintendo gets its cut. And there is no way to separate the logic of you are a gatekeeper over software distribution on your device from a whole raft of other companies and the way other companies operate. Consequently to that sentence, that finding, they find that Apple has a dominant position in the mobile app store market in general and monopoly power over distribution of software applications on iOS devices as Apple's app store is the only method to distribute software applications on iOS devices. Now that finding in and of itself is a little bit technologically inaccurate insofar as we've talked about. You can jailbreak your iPhone the risk there is that you don't have it operating under warranty, but you can use your hardware as you see fit and you can put whatever software you want on it, but the iOS doesn't support it specifically. And maybe the argument would be it's no longer an iOS device if you've jailbroken your phone. And maybe that would be an interesting debate topic for some parliamentarian at some point in the future. But suffice it to say, you can get software applications on your iPhone. It's just very difficult and Apple won't support it. They say the former director of the app review team, which winds up being one of their big witnesses in this document for the app store, observed that Apple is not subject to any meaningful competitive constraint from alternative distribution channels. Now, Apple says that's not true. Apple says where we are competing is at the phone level where we only have 20 or 25% globally. And we have to have a good product as part of our phone, which is holistic through the app store and the iOS. And that's where we are competing. And if we don't have a good enough product, we won't gain market share in that market. And long story short, for the bulk of the history of the antitrust laws, that has been an argument that I think would hold. Now, we haven't done a lot of judicial decision making around digital and hardware and these kinds of things. But in general, brands are allowed to create their own hardware, create their own devices, and they are allowed to compete at that level. And the functionality of the device, which the App Store is, isn't usually something that is assailed in this way. Doesn't mean the law can't change. Doesn't mean that the judges can't change their opinion of what Sherman and Clayton say, which is what Congress recommends, which is why you always see me kind of arguing both sides and talking about the strengths and weaknesses of the argument from both sides here. But historically, this hasn't been a winning argument. In response to these concerns, Apple has not produced any evidence that the App Store is not the sole means of distributing apps on iOS devices and that it does not exert monopoly power over app distribution. Right, because they can't for the most part. They can say you can jailbreak your phone. That doesn't really help them from the overall standpoint. And they do control access to their iOS. They just say that they're allowed. 
Apple claims that the App Store competes in a larger software distribution market that includes other mobile app stores, as well as the open internet, personal computers, gaming consoles, smart TVs, and online brick and mortar retail stores. We're competing with software from everywhere. We're just a device manufacturer. But Congress says the following. While consumers can access software and developers can distribute software through those platforms, none of those platforms permit consumers to access apps on an iOS device or for developers to distribute apps to iOS devices. That's absolutely true. But finding that to be the nexus point for where you get in trouble if you are Apple or Microsoft or Sony or Nintendo is inherently problematic. That if you can't control access to your own device, if the market is what you can get on our device, then every wall garden everywhere suddenly has a very significant problem. Apple's monopoly power over software distribution on iOS devices appears, note the appears here, to allow it to generate supranormal profits from the App Store and its services business. The services business accounted for nearly 18% of total revenue, $46.2 billion in fiscal year 2019. If we go and we look at this chart, you see the $46 billion here, $42,018, 2017 This is a growing service segment. It's unclear to me, having read this, exactly what suggests this is super competitive as much as it is growth in a competitive industry, but Congress did find it, and so we have to take it on its face for purposes of this document. They also note some other things that don't really come up in Epic versus Apple, but that really did cause problems for Congress. They really had issues with this kind of behavior at really all levels from all four companies, and that's extensive mergers, right? So they say in 2019, Apple CEO Tim Cook told CNBC that Apple buys a new company every two to three weeks with a focus on acquiring talent and intellectual property. An Apple submission to the subcommittee explains it as follows has not embarked on a strategy of acquiring nascent competitors in service of its growth and market position. We aren't trying to kill competition. Instead, according to Apple, Apple's acquisitions generally are meant to complement its product business by accelerating innovation and building out new features and technologies for Apple's hardware and software offerings, which is what I was talking about earlier in this video. I've had a number of clients. I've had venture capital funded clients whose primary business model was go out, get something shiny, show that it works, and get bought. And the apples of the world, the big manufacturers of the world, the big strategics of the world, very often have what amount to an acquisition fund that is outsourced research and development. If they go and they follow these little companies, they say that could be something that we could integrate into our product, and we buy them, and they get an exit, and we get a component. And it's basically like we paid for research and development, but we otherwise just bought an outside company and got the intellectual property for ourselves. That hasn't been seen as terribly problematic historically, but now in big tech and in this digital environment, Congress is finding that to be a more significant issue. Then we talk about Apple's conduct. What we have here is commissions and in-app purchases. This hits directly at what Epic has been talking about this whole time, and this particular section is going to be very useful to them. They're going to file this with the judge. Apple charges a 30% commission on paid apps, those that charge a fee for users to download, downloaded from the app store. It also takes a 30% fee on in-app purchases of digital goods and services. Now note one thing that Epic gets right off the bat from this congressional finding. That's two separate sentences. That's payment from downloads and a fee on in-app purchases. Epic, remember, has been trying to establish that these are two separate markets. And that's been a contention that the judge has indicated might not be flying for her. We talked about that with respect to oral argument. We talked about that at the temporary restraining order level. That doesn't appear to have been something that really works for this particular judge. But by separating it out, by actually framing it out this way, and we'll see kind of references here from the congressional findings, they're trying to establish that this is something extra, that these are two separate markets. You'll also see Congress take full hook, line, and sinker the notion that the 30% on in-app payment processing is just that is just for payment processing and that 5% or 3% should be something that is more reasonable. Now, I tend to look at this as something that comes from Congress and is maybe a little bit technologically illiterate. And I apologize to those of you that are backing Epic. That's totally fine. You can totally agree with the in-app payment processing argument if you want. I find it to be completely separate from what the App Store actually is, what it's offering. That what Apple is actually doing is saying we get 30% if it comes through us for something digital that operates on our phone and that they aren't separate markets. But Congress 
disagrees. They also take offense to communication. Apps are not permitted to communicate with iOS users that the app may be available for purchase at a lower price outside the app store, provided links outside of the app that may lead users to find alternative subscription and payment methods or offer their own payment processing mechanism in the app to avoid using Apple's IAP. Apps that violate Apple's policies can be removed from the app store, losing access to the only means of distributing apps, to who? To consumers with iOS devices. Now again, Apple's made the kind of legal argument that says, no, you're not really prohibited from getting it to consumers that have iOS devices. You just can't send it through the iOS. I doubt Apple would try that trick with Congress, but it is worth noting that Apple's primary contention is you don't need an iPhone to play Fortnite. So what are we talking about here? And while I think that kind of skips some of what Epic is saying, it isn't something that should be completely disregarded as Congress does here. That it is worth noting that all of this software in various regards can generally be gotten somewhere else. And so that does tend to limit Apple's ability to do certain things with respect to its pricing and its monopoly power over iOS access. Apple describes its policies as a standard industry practice and says that other app stores charge the same fees. In 2020, Apple funded a study that concluded that other software distribution platforms run by Google, Amazon, Samsung, Microsoft, and others, it's interesting that they shortened that to others, right? Because it would be a much longer list charge identical or similar commissions on software downloads and transactions, and that commissions are common in other digital markets. Apple also highlighted that its commissions are lower than the cost of software distribution by brick-and-mortar retailers, which dominated the marketplace prior to the introduction of the App Store. Apple also noted that 84% of all apps distributed through the App Store pay no commissions or fees. Apple does not take a commission on purchases from apps like Uber or Etsy that sell physical goods or services. Apple also makes some exceptions for things like readers, Apple also makes exceptions for third-party premium video apps, talking about the 15% that people have brought up. Mr. Cook explained, today there are over 130 apps that participate in this program, and the reduced 15% commission is available to all developers offering premium video content on the same terms as Amazon Prime Video, with the same qualification criteria. Amazon Prime Video, Altice One, I think I might be pronouncing that correctly, and Canal Plus have been publicly confirmed as participants. So that 15% that Amazon Prime negotiated, they didn't just give Amazon Prime a side letter, at least as Apple describes it. They gave criteria for getting that 15% that wasn't identical to what they were otherwise charging 30% on, and others have qualified as participants in that program. Maybe that's okay with you, maybe it's not, but Apple's trying to establish that they are trying to be fair for different uses of the phone. Now, despite all of that, despite Apple saying, hey, 30% is standard, hey, it's lower than brick and mortar, 84% don't charge anything, the committee starts talking basically to competitors and the members of CAF, right? During the investigation, the subcommittee received evidence from app developers regarding Apple's commissions and fees for IAP. ProtonMail, a secure email provider, explained that Apple's justification of its 30% commission overlooks the dynamics of the marketplace for distributing software to consumers with iOS devices, conflating practices that may be unremarkable in competitive markets, but abusive in monopoly markets. Now that's interesting, right? There certainly could be things that are abusive in one context and not another, but let's look at what the example is. For example, personal computer users can install software from app stores run by Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and others, so they can download software directly from the software developer's website and bypass app stores altogether. Remember what we just talked about with respect to Amazon and saying that people couldn't have their own app stores online, but we'll just put that aside for right now. Similarly, Apple's Mac app store is one of many options for Mac users to download software. While Samsung is a global leader in smartphones, the Samsung Galaxy store is one of several app stores available on Samsung's mobile devices. Google's Play Store dominates app distribution on Android devices and and is the most apt comparison to the app store, but Google permits some competition via sideloading and alternative app stores. Okay, we haven't really gotten to, you are a monopolist, we haven't gotten to abuse yet. In contrast, Apple owns the iOS operating system as well as the only means to distribute software on iOS devices. It responds to attempts to circumvent its fees and commissions with removal from the app store. Because of this policy, developers have no other option than to play by Apple's rules to reach customers who own iOS devices. Again, that's true but it's an unusual bit of truth to actually operate under the law. A group of developers that filed a lawsuit against Apple because of this policy argued that the persistence of Apple's 30% rate over time 
particularly despite the inevitable accrual of experience and economies of scale, indicates there is insufficient competition. That's interesting. It's just a claim in a lawsuit, however, and apparently one that hasn't been adjudicated as of yet. If we go and we look, we see this is Cameron versus Apple. So it's still in process. But at the end of the day, the 30% hasn't been changed. And the fact that it didn't go down is what you want to accuse Apple of being a monopolist with. However, they also bring up in the open PC environment that various of these other providers have 30%, like Steam, like various other places on the open PC environment, like the Mac App Store. So it's really unclear how you arrive at 30% is too high. And Congress really doesn't tie this together so well. They just established that Apple has made a lot of money and that seems like a little bit too much money from their perspective. And hey, look, we have all these people that would like to pay less money arguing that they should be paying less money. And I have no doubt that they would like to pay less money. The question as ever is, is Apple acting anti-competitively by holding on to a 30% rate? Industry observers have also challenged Apple's implicit claim that the iPhone was the start of the online software distribution market, which has Apple made that claim? Somebody will have to leave a comment to this video. Has Apple ever claimed that they were the start through iPhone of online software distribution in total? Or as Congress says, for example, Mac and iOS developer Brent Simmons remarked that when the App Store was created, developers were selling and distributing apps over the web and it worked wonderfully noting that he began distributing software over the internet in the 1990s. To which, again, if I'm Apple's counsel or if I'm looking at this from Apple's perspective, I say, okay, what has changed that has prevented you from doing that? You are allowed to distribute software over the internet right now. I can't stop you. Go nuts. But that doesn't mean that I have to give you access to my iPhone. It doesn't mean I have to give you access to my Xbox or my PlayStation 5. So what are we talking about here? Many developers have also stressed that because Apple dictates that the App Store is the only way to install software on iOS devices and requires apps offering digital goods and services implement the IAP mechanism that Apple has illegally tied IAP to the App Store. Consumers with iOS devices account for a disproportionately high amount of spending on apps, spending twice as much as Android users. Perhaps that should pose the question as to why that perhaps people that invest in a wall garden are more inclined to spend there because they feel safer, because they have that brand loyalty, because of X, Y, or Z, and that further iOS users seldom switch to Android because any number of reasons. Thus, developers cannot abandon the App Store. It is where the highest value customers are and will remain. Developers cannot abandon the App Store because they want to get access to iPhone users. Fair enough, but does that make... Apple and iOS a monopolist or a monopoly abuser. Developers further argue that Apple's 30% commission from IAP is a payment processing fee and not a distribution fee. In a submission to the subcommittee, Match said Apple distorts competition in payment processing by making access to its app store conditional on the use of IAP for in-app purchases, thus excluding alternative payment processors. IAP eventually becomes the vessel through which Apple extracts its extraordinary commissions. Two app developers that offer services that compete with Apple explained that IAP is a payment processing fee and not a distribution fee. Both pointed out that Apple does not charge apps for distribution, evidenced by the fact Apple admits distributing most apps for free. Instead, Apple generates revenue by adding a 30% processing fee on transactions in the App Store and using IAP. I have problems with this argument for a number of reasons, but the first one that popped into my head when I read this initially was... Is the argument that the antitrust subcommittee is making that Apple should be charging for distribution and that it would have cover for also charging for in-app payment processing? That if Apple were charging its consumers for downloads, as Epic suggests in their lawsuit, or if Apple had chosen a different business model that consumers might not like as much, that they would be more protected? Again, right now, and Congress disagrees with this as part of this document, which we will see, but right now, the, judge, the judiciary, the judges, the courts have decided that Sherman and Clayton and antitrust in the United States is all about protecting consumer welfare. And so one of the things you have to establish is that the consumers are harmed by your practices. And that just gets skipped in every piece of this argument. Apple responded to these complaints from developers by saying that it's a commission is not a payment processing fee and that it reflects the value of the App Store as a channel for the distribution of developers' apps and the cost of many services it incurs to maintain the App Store. 
Right. We've already established that there's a hundred million person market that likes their iPhone and that Apple wants to take its 30% cut. And if you don't like it, you don't have to sell on the iPhone. And yes, you don't get that access to the iPhone users. But again, is that a restraint of trade? Is that a monopolist abuse situation? Congress then uses Congress language to say that Apple is lying. (laughs) Apple's rationale for its commissions and fees has evolved over time. Prior to the App Store's debut in 2008, then Apple CEO Steve Jobs explained, we don't intend to make any money off the App Store. We're basically giving all the money to the developers and the 30% that pays for running the store. That'll be great. In 2011, Apple Chief Financial Officer Peter Oppenheimer explained to Apple's shareholders that Apple runs the App Store just a little over break even. But Apple's financial reports indicate that the App Store is faring far better than the modest business Apple originally contemplated. And again, the question has to be, and you are free to disagree in this space, in the comments or elsewise. But the, the question has to be, okay, Apple aimed this at breakeven. Apple did a lot better, didn't change its terms, didn't change anything about how it was operating the App Store. Is that some kind of abuse of power that deserves the U.S. government coming in and saying, you have to allow people onto your hardware? And what are the second order effects of that? What's the second order effect of investment in the App Store from Apple's side of things? What's the second order effect of Apple making new iPhones, supporting the hardware dynamic. People don't want to go to Android for some reason. And is that reason because there was a wall garden and there won't be any more? One of the things that philosophically the antitrust subcommittee, the Department of Justice, Congress in general should have to show is how what they are proposing to do helps. And I really do think reading through all of this, they haven't been able to make the case that what they would propose to do, as at least with respect to Apple, would actually help people. And so that's one of the things that I would also leave you with is that you should be asking the question, how how does this help? And, And maybe you think it does, and maybe you can leave that comment. But I have my doubts with what Congress has put forth in this document. They go to more developers. A gaming developer explained that the fees it pays Apple add up to millions of dollars or even tens or hundreds of millions of dollars for some developers, far in excess of the developer's estimate of Apple's costs of reviewing and hosting those apps. Now, Apple isn't a pass-through service provider. They aren't just charging you the labor for the review or the hosting of the apps. They're building a marketplace and they're charging you for access to that marketplace. The same, I would argue, as the Best Buy down the street that says, we've got people that come in here to buy video games or refrigerators or televisions, and so we're going to take a cut. And that doesn't represent the full price of our lease or the full price of the guy that's recommending the TV, it represents that plus a profit margin. And if you don't like it, you can sell it somewhere else. And that's normal competition. And Best Buy competes with other giant entertainment stores or other giant electronic stores. And it's at that level where they compete. And you aren't granted access to Best Buy because you don't like whatever cut they're taking, which is 30%, by the way. Although only estimates, these figures indicate that as the mobile app economy has grown, Apple's monopoly power over app distribution on iPhones permits the App Store to generate supranormal profits. These profits are derived by extracting rents from developers who either pass on price increases to consumers or reduce investments in innovative new services. Apple's ban on rival app stores and alternative payment processing locks out competition, boosting Apple's profits from a captured ecosystem of developers and consumers. Read those sentences together, right? This says that Because the mobile app economy has grown so much, Apple can get its 30% because 30% is worth a lot more than it was even 10 years ago. And that is somehow preventing people from entering the mobile app economy market. This would be the first economy in the history of the world where as it grows, you have less people interested in investing in it. And yes, Apple controls access to iOS. They certainly don't control access to mobile apps in general, but They have a lot of money there. They take their 30% and it's either worth it to you or it's not. But as Apple has 100 million units out, if that becomes 200 million units out, it becomes more and more valuable. And if they don't change their rates, it becomes difficult for me to see exactly why they should get in trouble on this score. We've talked about other ways in which Apple maybe should get in trouble, preferential treatment and things that really do come up that I think Congress makes some good points on. But with respect to 30% and in-app payment processing and and tying and these kinds of concepts, I really struggle to see how the laws could cover these things right now. And maybe that's covered when we get to it as part of this document where they say maybe the laws don't cover some of the problems that we have, that we have found as factual matters as part of this investigation. 
David Heinemeyer Hansen, the founder and CTO of Basecamp, testified at the subcommittee's fifth hearing that Apple's market power allows it to keep fees exorbitantly high. By comparison, he noted that other markets, such as credit card processes, are only able to sustain a 2% fee for merchants. Again, because they don't operate a market. A payment processor isn't operating hardware, isn't selling hardware, doesn't have conventions to get people invested in their ecosystem. So it's a terrible comparison, but it appears to be one that Congress has largely bought. Before the App Store, one developer reportedly explained that we typically paid about 5%, not 30%, to a payment processor, and it worked just as well for small developers as for large. And then we get Epic versus Apple. In August 2020, Epic Games introduced a direct payment option in its Fortnite app, allowing gamers to elect to use Apple's IAP or pay Epic directly. Epic's payment processing option that charged consumers 10%, a 20% discount from purchases using IAP, Worth noting there, as we pointed out at the start of this series, that it was not a 30% reduction and is notably higher than the 5% and 2% that Congress just told us was appropriate. In response, Apple disabled updates for Fortnite for violating the App Store guidelines. Under the App Store guidelines, apps may not provide any information that directs customers to purchasing mechanisms other than in-app purchase. In his questions for the record for the subcommittee's second hearing, Representative W. Gregory Stubbe asked Apple about banning communications to customers by app providers. Apple responded that its restrictions on communications between apps and customers are to ensure that Apple can collect commissions and prevent free riding, which appears to be used as some kind of silver bullet in this paragraph, but as we talked about, is entirely normal for retailers operating store spaces right? And maybe this applies more to distribution. Maybe that's one of the things that you have as a hang up if you're going to come in here and say, you know, Rick is wrong about one thing or the other. And you say, well, maybe IAP shouldn't be treated the same as the store spaces. And maybe you're right. And maybe that could be something that we could really tease out as part of this discussion. But at a fundamental level, it remains the Walmart or the Best Buy or what have you that won't allow you to put a sticker on your box or frame your box in a certain way that says, see this box here at the Walmart? You can get it for 25% off if you come directly to our website. That will not get shelf space at the Walmart or the Best Buy. That's in violation of the rules that they have on display at their stores. I worked at Electronics Boutique for many, many years to help go through school. (laughs) And these are the kinds of things that can't happen. The company described its policy as a prohibition on developers promoting via the App Store transactions outside the App Store and said Apple's policies were no different than most other retailers. And I struggled to find a difference myself. As Apple has emphasized growing its services business, App developers and technology writers have observed Apple is increasingly insistent that apps implement IAP. And this is some of the stuff that I think Apple really does find itself in trouble for. There were a lot of articles about this kind of thing. In June 2020, an email app developed by Basecamp called Hey was approved by the App Store and then abruptly told it would have to implement Apple in-app purchasing or face removal from the platform. While Hey's app updates were eventually allowed, Apple did force it to create a free trial option for iOS customers. Basecamp founder and CTO David Heinemeyer Hansen observed that Apple threatened and abused small app developers for years and that the conflict with Hey amounted to a shakedown. In August 2020, Apple denied WordPress the ability to update its app unless it implemented IAP, even though the WordPress app does not sell anything. Now, in that particular circumstance, the WordPress app didn't sell Premier Access, but it had Premier Access that you could get through the website and had showings of what you could get from Premier on the app. So yeah, I agree. Apple shouldn't be doing these things because they look bad and because they have these congressional investigations happening. But at the end of the day, Apple has been fairly consistent about if you're going to sell something and it's going to be shown in the app, you have to be able to buy it through the app uh, because we need to get our 30%. And if people become wise to that, which they are fully capable of doing, they can go straight to the Epic store. They can go straight to the WordPress store or whatever and potentially get a lower price in those locations. At the subcommittee's hearing on July 29th, 2020, Chairman Jerry Nadler asked Mr. Cook about the allegations that Apple was canvassing the App Store to extract commissions from businesses that had been forced to change their business model in order to survive during the pandemic. Mr. Cook responded that Apple would never take advantage of the pandemic, but justified the conduct in which they were taking commissions off of things like virtual meetings, explaining that the app developers were now offering what Apple defined as a digital service, and Apple was entitled to commissions. And they wound up waiving this until the end of 2020. But Apple says, look, you changed your business model. We get these commissions. And again, I think that's unwise from a public relations perspective, but I also don't think it's necessarily anti-competitive. 
Developers have submitted evidence that Apple's commissions and fees, combined with the lack of competitive alternatives to the App Store and IAP, harm competition and consumers. Developers have. For instance, Match called Apple's fee for IAP unreasonable, sure, leading to higher prices for consumers and an inferior user experience and a reduction of innovation, which is difficult to prove in iOS. One developer that offers an app that directly competes with Apple told the subcommittee that it was forced to raise prices to pay Apple's commission. Epic Games, which recently filed an antitrust complaint against Apple, has told a federal court that Apple's fees and commissions force developers to increase the prices they charge in order to pay Apple's app tax. There is no method app developers can use to avoid this tax. Now, of course, Epic was charging the same thing everywhere until August of this year and only lowered it to make this point. So Epic is, again, a very poor quarterback for these kinds of arguments. And I think a lot of the other companies here make better and stronger arguments. That all being said, Epic does have to go recoup that 30% somehow if it wants to get that money back. Congress also notes that international competition authorities have examined the competitive effects of Apple's app store commissions and fees and are finding certain things that maybe those authorities have a problem with. Of course, those aren't reflective of United States law, but they do reference them here to establish that a lot of people are looking in to Apple. Then we get a section on pre-installed apps. The subcommittee examined whether Apple abuses its role as iOS and app store owner to preference its own apps or harm rivals. This is a place where I think much more than the 30% and the IAP and the tying Apple could find itself in trouble. In the document now, it says, like setting advantageous defaults and pre-installing its own apps, Apple is also able to preference its own services by reserving access to APIs and certain device functionalities for itself. This is the kind of thing that winds up getting you analyzed as a vertical monopoly. And so I really do look at this and say, if Apple is going to get in trouble for these kinds of things, it's for that, it's for preferencing their own stuff above even people that are otherwise fully complying with their guidelines. And that extends to app search rankings, where Congress found some interesting things in how Apple was doing its own app store search. The reporting on app store search also revealed that Apple may also advantage its apps by holding them to a different standard when they appear in the app store search rankings. Apple Store told the Wall Street Journal that it uses 42 factors to determine where apps rank, but that as Congress points out here, and we'll skip ahead a little bit, that because the Apple pre-installed apps don't have ratings, it becomes difficult to see exactly why they should always appear at the top of these various lists. And they have some indications here that Apple apps sometimes come up as the first 15 apps when you do a specific search in the app store. And I do think it's the kind of thing that could get Apple in trouble. And it's the kind of thing that makes people dislike Apple and winds up with some kind of rise up in favor of Epic, if you're looking at Apple versus Epic, where I analyze it, looking at Sherman, looking at the president, looking at the law, where people come into my videos and say, Apple is evil and you should support Epic because Epic is trying to break them up. I understand the emotionality of the argument. I understand how when Apple does these kinds of things, potentially advantaging its own applications, potentially having arbitrary enforcement of its guidelines, potentially advantaging itself in its own search on the App Store, that you could look at this and say, well, it's an inherently unfair market and so I shouldn't like it. And I agree that you shouldn't like it. The question after that is, should the law do anything about it? Competitively sensitive information. In addition to investigating allegations Apple engages in self-preferencing in the App Store, the committee sought information regarding whether Apple exploits third-party developers that rely on distribution in the App Store. Now note, the antitrust laws do not protect app developers from competition and platforms should continue to innovate and improve their products and services. However, Sherlocking which is a name I wasn't familiar with, but which is given to effectively somebody that's a platform holder looking at something that goes through their platform and deciding how it works and doing it themselves can be anti-competitive in some instances. And apparently Apple is guilty of this in a number of ways that at least Congress has found. And they also note a specific problem with the app developer guidelines and that I tend to agree with is a problem. While the Apple developer agreement provides Apple the right to replicate third-party apps, Apple's guidelines direct developers not to copy another's developer's work and threaten removal of apps and expulsion from the developer program for those that do. Now, I think what Apple's actually trying to get at here, playing devil's advocate, is that we don't want a bunch of clone games in there, so do your own spin at minimum, which I think Apple would argue is what they do when they kind of take somebody else's idea and incorporate it directly into an app on the iOS, but that if you just clone things, we need to have the ability in our guidelines to say, get out of here, get off the store, because that's not the kind of garbage that we want. Now, I know a number of you will come into the comments and say Apple's iStore already does that. 
there's already a bunch of clones. There's already a bunch of junk. They can't keep all that stuff off their store. And I agree. I agree that Apple isn't 100% on this. They might not even be 50% on this. But as a lawyer, from a legal perspective, they need to have some kind of framework in their developer guidelines that say this is a bad thing that we should be able to take steps against. But I think Congress is right to point out that they need to do a better job explaining what is a problem and what is not so that this kind of thing where they otherwise evolve, hopefully, another's app to be put into their iOS is not something that can be turned around against them. Uh, we've got excluding rival apps. We've got a whole discussion of things that pop up where uh, Apple is excluding potential rivals from operating on their iOS. And then we've got opaque guidelines and arbitrary enforcement, which I really do think is a problem. And it's the kind of thing that go- does get Congress up in an ire. Where we've got, once again, David Heinemeyer Hansen testifying before the subcommittee explaining that the interpretation of the guidelines is a complete tyranny. And the rules are often interpreted differently by different reviewers because they are intentionally left vague. One developer described Apple's guidelines as arbitrarily interpreted and another party that called it opaque and arbitrary. Others have noted that Apple unilaterally determines if, how, and when to apply its guidelines and that it also freely makes up unwritten rules when convenient. For example, Apple's distinction between business and consumer apps to justify its June 2020 decision to require Basecamp to redesign its app to permit in-app signups an attempt to require implementation of IAP was not a distinction that appeared in Apple's guidelines until an update on September 11th, 2020. Just following this case as I have been, I would note that that does appear to be the way Apple operates. They find a problem and then they change their guidelines or their license agreements after the fact. It is no question in my mind that after Epic versus Apple, or maybe even in the middle of it, they will change certain of their license terms and certain of their guidelines to try to address some of the issues that have been brought up in this lawsuit. No, I don't think that's a great way to do business. No, I don't think having largely ambiguous terms is a great way for companies to operate. I think you can see about 100 videos in virtual legality where I go over terms of service, and I might go over some more either this afternoon or tomorrow about PlayStation and Sony, and where I say, look, this is what they do. They retain these ambiguous rights so that they can use them how they see fit, whether that's Twitch or YouTube or otherwise. And that includes Apple, and I don't like it. And one of the reasons virtual legality exists is to break down some of these terms and to show you how they reserve ambiguous power to themselves. And I think that is something that you can rightly call out Apple on. Should it be illegal? I have my questions there, but it is certainly something that puts you in the spotlight if you operate the way Apple has been operating. So with those ambiguities, we see them kind of discussed even further in Congress. In a subsequent interview with Mr. Shoemaker, the former director of App Review for the App Store subcommittee staff asked about Apple's treatment of app developers. Mr. Shoemaker responded that Apple was not being honest when it claims it treats every developer the same. Mr. Shoemaker also admitted that Apple's advantages its own apps over third-party apps. In an interview with subcommittee staff, he described it as inaccurate to say Apple does not favor its own apps over third-party apps. He has previously noted that apps that compete against Apple services have a track record of problems getting through the App Store's review process. Now, I don't know Mr. Shoemaker's history. He's clearly not working at Apple anymore. He gave all this congressional testimony really against Apple. But I think just knowing Apple as we do, seeing how the iOS app store operates, this seems about right, right? That Apple runs its own stuff through a little bit easier than the third party stuff. And probably Apple makes the third party review process a little bit harder if it's going to be directly competitive with something that Apple already offers. If that is in fact the case, I don't think Congress really gets there in terms of evidence here. There's some assertions and there's some testimony and there's some kind of documentary evidence, but not really making this abundantly apparent. If this is in fact the case, this is the kind of thing that Apple really will get in trouble for, right? Preferential treatment against direct competitors on this other kind of interface, this other marketplace, this software component to your iOS, when they're otherwise allowed because they followed all your rules, And then you just say, oh, you didn't follow this rule that we're interpreting differently for the first time ever. And we know in the back of everybody's mind that that's because this third party is going to compete directly with books or maps or what have you. I think that is the place where Apple could find themselves in a significant amount of problem. It isn't necessarily the same place that Epic is bringing up in their court case against them. We're going to skip Siri. There's a whole section on whether Siri's intelligence voice assistant is a problem. But overall, those are the findings. And as you can tell from this video, those findings are pretty damning in terms of Apple. I labeled this as Congress makes Epic's case, but indeed they did. This actually follows the streamlined efforts of the Coalition for App Fairness 
pretty well. Very much so, as a matter of fact. And a lot of the parties on the CAF have actually given testimony and are referenced in this document uh, in a way that suggests that CAF is right on in respect of how Congress is operating and and knew that this was where Congress was going to go with respect to this document. I did note as part of that initial tweet that this was a Democrat-led document, but I also noted as part of this video that that maybe didn't matter so much. I pulled up now the Buck Report, or I believe he calls it the third way, in which he actually says the majority's findings are correct. It says the majority staff accurately portrays how Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook have used their monopoly power to act as gatekeepers to the marketplace, undermine potential competition, and pick winners and losers, all while simultaneously cozying up to unfriendly nations like China in order to further expand their global footprint. The report also offers a chilling look into how Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook have used their power to control how we see and understand the world. Now, Apple really doesn't have that complaint levied against it, but that's kind of a problem of combining all of these various things. It is fundamentally anti-competitive to simultaneously serve as the only substantial marketplace operator, including setting terms, policies, and fees, host third-party sellers, and use marketplace data to launch and sell competitive products. Now, you still have to establish that Apple is the only marketplace operator of a relevant marketplace, but, yep, those things are generally considered to be anti-competitive. Furthermore, the report described how Apple transformed itself from a revolutionary hardware company that specialized in producing iPods, iPhones, iPads, and Macintosh computers into a company focused on developing software to compete with third-party application developers on the App Store. Apple claims to offer the same set of terms and services to all potential app developers, but the subcommittee's investigation found that Apple has engaged in harmful practices that preclude competition, including requiring certain competitors to pay a 30% surcharge for web development services while self-preferencing internal products on the App Store and offering internal products as pre-downloaded apps that cannot be deleted. Now, that 30% concept as a surcharge for web development services is a bit unclear there, but note what is really a problem here on the Republican side. They, like me, really don't like when Apple engages in that preferential treatment and uses the arbitrary enforcement of its rules to create problems. As an example to that 30% surcharge, all new Apple products come preloaded with the Apple Music app. Apple Music only requires a $9.99 per month subscription before a user can enjoy unlimited streaming music. However, Apple charges major competitors, including Spotify, a 30% fee for similar treatment on the App Store, and users are forced to pay $12.99 per month for a Spotify membership. Now, users are forced to pay is is perhaps accurate because that's the price that Spotify sets. Spotify could, of course, have set $9.99 and eaten the profit margin difference itself. But more importantly, when you read these kinds of things, Again, you have to read it from the opposite side. If this is what the antitrust subcommittee is saying, are they suggesting that consumers would be benefited by Apple Music being at a $12.99 price point? And I think it's important for us all to ask ourselves whether that is what they are saying. And if it is what they are saying, how does that benefit consumers? And yeah, Spotify doesn't have to charge $12.99, just like Epic didn't charge a surcharge for for Apple uh, iOS in-app payment for V-Bucks in Fortnite, at least not until August of 2020. And so you get these kinds of comments about 30% surcharges that are the same across marketplaces. And I think you combine all these issues in a way that gives Apple the ability to defend itself across all vectors when maybe some of the things it really shouldn't have the ability to defend itself on. That preferential treatment stuff, the ambiguous guidelines, all that stuff is worthwhile to pursue. The 30%, the in-app payment processing, I really don't think is. Finally, from this report, we get some of the stuff that I really have issue with, which is talking about the judiciary, right? Finally, the report details how antitrust enforcement agencies and regulators have hobbled their own abilities to conduct effective oversight of the marketplace by adhering to a narrow web of jurisprudence instead of following the letter of the law as Congress intended. Now, this just kind of skips the whole way the U.S. government works, right? The Congress writes the laws, the courts interpret them, And then the executive branch really shouldn't be in the business of advantaging the congressional intent, which is very difficult to establish, over what the judiciary found to be the statutory reading and the congressional intent. So actually framing this as the FTC and the Department of Justice should be acting against this narrow web of jurisprudence is inherently problematic for any lawyer that looks at these kind of arguments. 
The Clayton Sherman and Federal Trade Commission acts were all written with broad interpretations to ensure antitrust regulators would not be hamstrung by future market developments. However, antitrust enforcers have boxed themselves in by relying on judicial interpretations instead of statutory language and congressional intent. This is just a bizarre set of arguments, right? This is arguing against what we have talked about with respect to monopolization, that the Federal Trade Commission has out here what the courts say. The courts ask if a leading position was gained or maintained through improper conduct. That is something other than having a better product, superior management, or historic accident. Obtaining a monopoly by superior product innovation or business acumen is legal. For instance, the monopolist may be competing on the merits in a way that benefits consumers through greater efficiency or a unique set of products or services. In the end, it's the courts that will decide whether the monopolist's success is due to the willful acquisition or maintenance of that power as distinguished from growth or development as a consequence of a superior product, business acumen, or historic accident. This and the congressional document in general is fighting against all of these years of antitrust interpretation. And maybe that's the right call. I'm not in Congress. I can't tell you whether that's the right call or not. It's a policy discussion. But it is worth noting that this, antitrust enforcers have boxed themselves and no, they've listened to what the court has told them to do, which is entirely what we expect of the executive branch when the court tells them to do it. This would be like Congress having a statute invalidated as unconstitutional and coming out and saying, well, that's just what the judges think. It's just what the Supreme Court thinks. So forget it. Enforce it anyway, president. It's ridiculous on its face. And I I do think that maybe the congressional document makes this claim a little bit. It actually does it a little bit better than this report. But I wanted to point it out because one, the Republicans and Democrats are in agreement on all of the findings in this document, which means that a unified bipartisan congressional subcommittee has determined that Apple is acting with monopoly power in restraint of trade and violation of the antitrust laws. So that is worth noting. Epic will use that in their court case. It isn't the end all be all, of course, but it is worth noting. Then we get to their recommendations. We're going to go over these really, really quickly because we're already over an hour in this video, but I wanted to talk about what it is that they're actually recommending. So their recommendations are as follows. First, they say structural separations are something that we should be looking at. That means breakups. That means prohibitions on the gas station also running the oil fields. What that looks like in a digital ecosystem is a little bit unclear. A lot of this seems to be aimed a little bit more at Google and Facebook than at Amazon and Apple, but they want to have potentially structural breakups. That won't happen tomorrow. That won't happen in five years because of how these cases go. And a Department of Justice has to have an appetite for taking on these huge megalithic companies. But that's what they are proposing is something that should be needed here and something that they would advocate for the Department of Justice to pursue. They also want to implement rules to prevent discrimination, favoritism, and self-preferencing, which I would argue are probably already covered for the most part in the Sherman Antitrust Act. And maybe they're right in saying it's not properly being uh, used by the FTC and the Department of Justice at this point in time. But it's also not a recommendation that I'm too terribly broken up about. I think there should, in general, be at bare minimum, maybe not a rule against favoritism, but if you're going to give yourself favoritism, that you declare it loud and proud in your terms of service. That if we have freedom of contract and you put that in your developer guidelines, hey, our stuff is going to be advantaged, then at least everybody knows going in. And that should be something that maybe in terms of transparency should be something that Congress looks at enforcing. They want to promote innovation through interoperability and open access. Now, this isn't really targeted at any of the companies in specific, although Facebook is referenced in a number of places. The dynamic is particularly evident in the social networking market. But ultimately, what they want to say is they want to be able to allow competition in the various markets and to prevent switching costs, specifically in Facebook, where you already have the main product being the presence of a lot of people there. They talk about interoperability a little bit. They talk about data portability. They want to reduce market power through merger presumptions. Now, what does that mean? It means that they want to be able to presume that certain operators in a given market should not be allowed to merge. The firms investigated by the subcommittee owe part of their dominance to mergers and acquisitions. Despite a significant number of ongoing antitrust investigations, the dominant platforms have continued to pursue significant deal making. They want to change the presumption that it's okay to a presumption that it's not. Uh, And that would certainly chill a lot of the acquisitions in this industry. The question as ever is, does that actually help growth and innovation in the industry? Does it help the consumer at the end of the day? 
They want to create an even playing field for the free and diverse press, which really doesn't touch on Apple too much, prohibit abuse of superior bargaining power and require due process is a very tricky one to actually do, right? Because these companies do have superior bargaining power. That's not illegal in and of itself. What does abuse mean? That's probably going to be as vaguely defined as monopolization under Sherman. And so what does that mean in reality? Maybe that is something that requires contours because right now all they say is there needs to be stronger imposition on this quote unquote abuse of that bargaining power. Then we get to the antitrust laws themselves, right? In the decades since Congress enacted these foundational statutes, the courts have significantly weakened these laws and made it increasingly difficult for federal antitrust enforcers and private plaintiffs to successfully challenge anti-competitive conduct and mergers. Through adopting a narrow construction of consumer welfare as the sole goal of the antitrust laws, the Supreme Court has limited the analysis of competitive harm to focus primarily on price and output rather than the competitive process or competitive process itself. And we've talked about that in this series. The antitrust laws have been interpreted to focus first and foremost on consumer welfare and not on competition or the competitive process, because as we've already seen in this series, that is not something that the courts and Congress are very well equipped to handle. Apple says 30% is fine. The competitor says it should be lower. That's going to be something that happens in every contractual dispute ever in the history of business and capitalism and elsewise. So what the antitrust laws can focus on is does any of these combinations, these restraints, these contracts, do they affect the end line consumer? And if they don't, government in general probably shouldn't have its business sticking its nose in and changing economic terms that it can't know, even in 400 pages of documentation, as well as the actual market participants. So Congress is saying something that I personally, philosophically, a little editorialization here, find to be very problematic to expand the antitrust concept to focusing on the competitive process gives competitors a lot of additional power that maybe will ultimately hurt the functioning of the economy in a way that is designed to help who exactly? Epic? Tim Sweeney? These various other companies in CAF? I think that's a very difficult case to make. In recent decades, The Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission have contributed to this problem by taking a narrow view of their legal authorities and issuing guidelines that are highly permissive of market power and its abuse. In part due to this narrowing, some of the anti-competitive business practices that the subcommittee's investigation uncovered could be difficult to challenge under current law. That's a heck of a sentence for a lawyer, right? Because you've already described the business practices as anti-competitive, presumably from a legal construct. You've talked about all the acts already, but you also say, well, maybe they're not illegal under the present law, which is fine if you're Congress to say, but it's difficult to actually establish that the practices themselves are illegal and anti-competitive if they are not able to be challenged under current law. And I do think that a lot of the stuff that we're talking about with respect to Apple falls under that category. I think the judge and what we saw in oral arguments and her reluctance to see this as something that was likely to be won by Epic stems from this jurisprudence, stems from these precedents, and Congress would seek to have them changed, but they are not changed as of yet. Their recommendations are to invigorate merger enforcement. They'd like to see Section 7 of the Clayton Act, Section 2 of the Clayton Act, Section 2 of the Sherman Act broadened. The subcommittee's review of these relevant documents revealed that several of these acquisitions lessened competition, increased market power. We want to talk about mergers a lot. We want to codify bright line rules and structural presumptions in concentrated markets. A major change in antitrust enforcement over the last few decades has been the shift away from bright line rules in favor of rule of reason case by case analysis. Although the rule of reason approach is said to reduce errors in enforcement through fact specific analysis, in practice, the standard tilts heavily in favor of defendants because the rule of reason says, is what you are doing anti competitive? by analyzing all the facts and circumstances of what the the judge or the court of appeals or the Supreme Court is looking at in front of them, rather than per se illegality, right? That's what Epic keeps bringing up in their case. They keep saying that the tying of the app distribution to the IAP is per se illegal. And I've said that the current jurisprudence says it's not. And certainly Apple has the better case in respect of that precedent right now. To respond to this concern, the subcommittee recommends that members consider codifying Bright line rules for merger enforcement, including structural presumptions. Under a structural presumption, mergers resulting in a single firm controlling an outsized market share or resulting in a significant increase in concentration would be presumptively prohibited under Section 7 of the Clayton Act. 
It is the view of the subcommittee staff that the 30% threshold established by the Supreme Court in Philadelphia National Bank is appropriate, although a lower standard for monopsony or buyer power claims may deserve consideration. Let's hit this bad boy at 30% or lower. That should be presumptively prohibited. And is that intended to be limited to the digital marketplace? Or are you seeking to change antitrust law in the United States massively on a massive industry-wide scale? Protect potential rivals, nascent competitors, and startups. To strengthen the law relating to potential rivals and nascent competitors, subcommittee staff recommend strengthening the Clayton Act to prohibit acquisitions of potential rivals and nascent competitors. Now, I've already talked about my history, my book of business, what I've done throughout my career. But I find this to be completely anathema to how the economy actually works when we're talking about venture capital and innovative startup companies. You want to prohibit these giant companies from acquiring potential rivals and nascent competitors. When anything that they do in this space could be deemed a potential rival or nascent competitor, what you are very likely to do, in my opinion, not in Congress, is limit the entrance in the first instance. If I have no capability of being bought by Apple or Amazon or Google or Facebook, then the value of my company is lower. There is a lower market for an exit for me. Venture capitalists are not interested in living there forever. They're interested in exits. And if that exit is not on the horizon, or if the marketplace for people that you could exit to is suddenly cut in half with the biggest players prohibited from buying you, then all of a sudden your value, the value of your nascent competitor is much, much lower is much less likely to be invested in, is much less likely to exist in the first instance. So when you talk about these things, that's fine. You have a problem with this. You have a concern. I think it's a justified concern that maybe there's a little bit too much consolidation. Absolutely. But take into account the other side of how this all works, which is that you still want people investing in those nascent competitors, in those potential rivals. And that's something that has to be part and parcel of the list, unless you just don't care about consumer welfare and you're just compared to something ambiguous, like overall competitive qualities of the marketplace. They want to strengthen the vertical merger doctrine. The subcommittee's investigation identified several ways in which vertical integration of dominant platforms enabled anti-competitive conduct. For this reason, the subcommittee recommends that Congress examine proposals to strengthen the law relating to vertical mergers. I tend to agree with this. The way these digital platforms operate, Apple included, winds up looking like a vertical uh, operation winds up looking like a company that both owns the oil field and the gas station. And so you probably do need to look at this from an antitrust perspective. This isn't an industry that we have examined before at any great level of depth uh, in the law. And maybe just like when we're talking about preferential treatment, ambiguous rules and guidelines, this should be something that should be a part of that conversation. I tend to agree with this recommendation. Rehabilitate monopolization law. Section two of the Sherman Act makes it illegal to monopolize or attempt to monopolize or combine or conspire with any other person or persons to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce among the several states. Over recent decades, courts have significantly heightened the legal standards that plaintiffs must overcome in order to prove monopolization. And that's what exists today. So they want to cover dominance rather than monopolization. To address this concern, subcommittee staff recommends that Congress consider extending the Sherman Act to prohibit abuses of dominance. Furthermore, the subcommittee should examine the creation of a statutory presumption that a market share of 30% or more constitutes a rebuttable presumption of dominance by a seller. Again, just like above with respect to mergers and the Clayton Act, the subcommittee recommendation here is that you should not be required to have monopolization power at all. You should just be required to have 30% or maybe even 25% of a market to have a rebuttable presumption, something that you can prove is wrong, that you dominate the market. And I think that is a major, major suggested change to antitrust law in the United States. I don't think it's one that's likely to fly across all of Congress, but it does suggest what the thought process of the subcommittee, or more specifically, the subcommittee staff, is with respect to this report. Monopoly leveraging. The subcommittee's investigation found that the dominant platforms have engaged in monopoly leveraging, where a dominant firm uses its monopoly power in one market to boost or privilege its position In another market, for example, Google's use of its horizontal search monopoly to advantage its vertical search offerings is a form of monopoly leveraging. This is similar, if not identical, to what we were talking about with respect to aftermarkets and the fact that you don't have to have a primary monopoly position in one to have a monopoly position in the later. This is that, in effect, in reverse, that you can use a monopoly position in one to advantage another market. They would like to see this addressed as well. 
Predatory pricing doesn't really apply to Apple. They think they're charging too much. But they say the subcommittee's investigation identified several instances in which a dominant platform was pricing goods or services below cost in order to drive out rivals and capture the market. This, again, kind of highlights that weakness, right? This is the opposite of the problem they have with Apple. So it isn't a great thing to say about Apple. And then this is a big one as well. Essential facilities and refusals to deal. Because the dominant platforms do not face meaningful competition in their primary markets, their threats to refuse business with a third party is the equivalent of depriving a market participant of an essential input that they are effectively vendors of inputs in the manufacturing process appears to be what that sentence is trying to address. They say to address this concern, the subcommittee recommends that Congress consider revitalizing the essential facilities doctrine or the legal requirement that dominant firms provide access to their infrastructural services or facilities on a non-discriminatory basis. Remember, they called out Amazon for having web servers offered to their competitors. To clarify the law, Congress should consider overriding judicial decisions that have treated unfavorably essential facilities and refusal to deal based theories of harm. And that is, in fact, the case. There is no essential facilities doctrine in the law as it stands right now. Revitalizing is a concept because it lived in certain smaller, lower courts before the Supreme Court quashed it. But ultimately, this says that there should be some obligation of these parties, in particular, maybe all parties, to have their businesses treated as essential facilities and to have the refusal to deal with another party treated as a violation of the antitrust laws. In respect of tying, subcommittee staff recommends that Congress consider clarifying that conditioning access to a product or service in which a firm has market power to the purchase or use of a separate product or service is anti-competitive. Now, they say, as held by Supreme Court in Jefferson Parish Hospital District versus Hyde, which we see here is a 1984 case. If you recall earlier in the series, we talked about the United States versus Microsoft, which established that in the digital software ecosystem where components of a specific operating system and these various kinds of things offer advantages to consumers and that tying can actually advantage consumer welfare, that those are not per se illegal. So they want to kind of revive this. They want to overturn Microsoft versus the United States in respect of this particular issue. And of course, if they did that, that would be massively advantageous to Epic, who, if they could show that IAP and app distribution are separate, would have a per se antitrust violation just by the fact that Apple requires IAP processing. They also want to get rid of self-preferencing and anti-competitive product design, uh, which we talked about earlier. They want to override certain things, and they want to do one last thing, which we will leave as basically the last thing that we talk about in this video. They want to clarify that false positives or erroneous enforcement are not more costly than false negatives, erroneous non-enforcement, and that when relating to conduct or mergers involving dominant firms, false negatives are costlier which just goes against basically everything that I believe in terms of the enforcement of law or legal paradigms, that it's better to let a hundred guilty men go free than one innocent man go to jail. This is the concept that the government should be totally fine prohibiting mergers, filing damages, issuing Department of Justice recommendations and requirements on a false positive basis that, hey, maybe we were wrong. That didn't actually help consumer welfare. That didn't actually help competition. You didn't actually do anything bad. That it's better to err on the side of doing it more and be more intrusive and more responsible for disruptions in the economy than it is to kind of take a conservative approach, to take a precautionary principle approach and say, hey, look, something has to be obviously bad. They have to show that it's bad before we act on this, before we say that they are in violation of the law. Congress here, their recommendation is that it's better to have false positives to pursue these enforcement actions, even if you're wrong, than to let somebody go that should have maybe had an enforcement action taken against them. And I couldn't possibly disagree more with that assertion. So at an hour and a half in, where does this leave us with respect to Apple versus Epic? So if you recall right now, the preliminary injunction is still being looked through by the judge in this particular case, right? And one of the components of winning a preliminary injunction on the Epic side of things, that Epic is asking for this preliminary injunction, is that they have to tell the judge that they have a high likelihood of success on the merits, that they're going to win this case. And the judges looked at this and said, well, it's certainly not a guarantee. It's a novel claim. And I think that still holds. I don't think this document actually fundamentally changes that, but it does put its thumb on the scales a little bit. Epic is now more likely to win than they were two days ago, based on the findings of Congress here, based on what Congress has indicated at both the Democrat and Republican levels 
are anti-competitive activities of Apple that line up identically with what Epic has accused Apple of. Now, they've also pointed out in this document, as we showed in this video, that it might not be something that is punishable by the current law. And certainly if the judge wound up getting this evidence and wanted to speak about it, either at the preliminary injunction or final decision level, and wanted to say that doesn't count or I'm not persuaded by Congress, you could say, look, the Sherman Antitrust Act has been looked at. I am bound by the precedents of both my court of appeals and the Supreme Court. This is what is required, market definitions, all these various things that Congress wants to get rid of. But until they do, I'm bound to interpret this as I was interpreting it two days ago. And in that interpretation, I still don't see a high likelihood of success on the merits. I don't know which direction this is going to go. What I can tell you is that my previous assumption that the temporary restraining order essentially remaining the same, that Apple can get rid of Fortnite, that it can keep Fortnite off the store, but it maybe can't affect the unreal entities, the Epic subsidiaries, is stronger now. I think you've got some more cover if you're the judge to say, look, you know what? Everything stays the same. And that's because Congress has these feelings and Epic has these feelings and Apple has these feelings. So we're just going to try to keep everything with as little damage as possible, even though it's clear that the judge doesn't like how Epic has behaved in this case and could still find that Apple can get rid of the Unreal contracts, but Epic can get it all back if it takes off the direct payment option from Fortnite until the case is finally adjudicated, which is all a very long, almost multi-hour way of saying This is a very important document. We will link it in the description of this video. I recommend people checking it out if they're interested in these kinds of things, but it doesn't represent new law. It doesn't represent anything that requires a judge to make a decision on its bases, and it doesn't require the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission to do anything specifically. Those are separate branches of government, and while this is an interesting and important piece of the puzzle, it isn't the final one, and we can anticipate and expect this series to continue for some time to come. This has been a very long form virtual legality for today. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching this whole thing. We love having you here. We talk about these things all the time. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.